All righty. So I guess you all know my name is Matt Pelican. I'm the director of the uh, Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life program. Hey, Dave. Good to see you, Dave Smalls, uh, logging in here uh, at, at Biodiversity Works. Um, I should be clear that I'm not an expert really on uh, iNaturalist. I'm just a, a chronic user of it, and I'm not affiliated with iNaturalist either. It's an independent platform that has nothing to do with biodiversity works or the Atlas of Life program, except that it's a platform that we, we use extensively. So uh, there are undoubtedly other perspectives on what I'm going to be talking about, and uh, probably people who are much more knowledgeable about, about it than I am. Um, very quickly, just to probably rehearse what you already know, the, the uh, Atlas of Life is a, is a cooperative project uh, of the of Biodiversity Works and the Betsy and Jesse Fink Family Foundation. Uh, it's been in, the project has been in operation for about a year and a half, which was when I was hired at Biodiversity Works. And it's got two goals uh, and sort of an overriding goal on top of those two. On the one hand, we want to compile the best uh, catalog of the diverse, diversity, biodiversity of Martha's Vineyard that we can. As you all know, the vineyard is a unique place in terms of its, uh, its wildlife and its habitats. And we want to capture that and document it as well as we can. Uh, and the second thing we want to do is really kind of a social program. We want to get as many people as we can involved in studying and appreciating that biodiversity. Um, ultimately, we hope that those two things, the scientific and the social, add up to more effective conservation and to uh, really a culture of stewardship on the vineyard to preserve and protect what I regard as uh, something that we are holding in trust for future generations, which is the uh, the unique biological characteristics and, and wildlife of the vineyard. Um, because we had, had both a scientific and a social mission in the project, um, relying on community science and particularly the iNaturalist platform was sort of a no-brainer when we started the started the, the Atlas of Life because it's a great way to uh, accumulate data. It's a great, you know, any number of people can contribute information and it, uh, the platform provides assistance in identifying things. It's just a, a great a, a great tool for this kind of project. So we really decided early on to crowdsource the Atlas of Life. And that's a very, that's baked into the, the DNA, you might say, of the project's, uh, project's origins. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I'm going to do a lot of screen sharing tonight, um, mostly because uh, I, I kind of want to show you things in real time on iNaturalist. Um, so you won't have to sit through PowerPoint slides. I hope that's a plus. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, you all probably are familiar with, uh, and I may just get rid of those thumbnails. Mm -hmm. um, you all probably familiar with uh, the iNaturalist dashboard. You may not be as familiar with the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life website, which we launched just earlier this summer. And the two are actually kind of related, although there's no real connection between the two of them. Uh, the Atlas of Life is a, is a this, is, this is a website that we run and iNaturalist has no role in it, except that we are gonna be relying on iNaturalist data for continuing ongoing improvements of the website. I'm, I may, I'm not gonna give you a, a full tour of this. You can poke it out, up, check it out sometime, uh, mval.biodiversityworksmv.org. Uh, but I do want to point to one specific section that is kind of the meat and potatoes of this website, which is this collection of species checklists for different groups. It's actually probably wrong to call it species checklists, but mm. uh, different groups of things where we have uh, aggregated information on what occurs here. And I call particular attention to this checklist of uh, mm -hmm. hoverflies or the family mm -hmm. surfity. Um, and we've got a, an essay which I composed just sort of summarizing the status of surfids on the vineyard. And then we have a checklist in spreadsheet form. And this, uh, this spreadsheet 
was generated with data from iNaturalist. It's research grade observations uh, from iNaturalist with a couple of other things added in. But basically this is, uh, this is uh, material taken directly from iNaturalist and then reformatted for this particular application. So we'll be doing that uh, quite a bit going down the line. Um, uh, I think I'm going to be doing probably uh, robber flies next and uh, maybe tachinid flies. And then uh, I want to get uh, true bugs, uh, uh, heteroptera, and a uh, couple of other groups up by the end of the year. So uh, it's an ongoing project. Eventually, you know, we want to have as many sections covered as we can because the goal is comprehensive uh, coverage. Okay, so uh, before I dive in, I will mention one thing about iNaturalist and that it has a really good help section. If you haven't found it, it resides under more oh. and help. Oh. And uh, you've got frequently asked questions and headings about observations and so on. So great resource that, uh, that you should know about. And uh, most of the answers to technical questions and specific how-to questions are going to be answered there. Mm. Um, all right, so hmm, this is aggravating. Why? Try it this way. Um, get this out of the way. There we go. That'll do it. Um, Zoom puts pieces of paraphernalia up on your screen and it gets in the way of whatever it is that you're trying to do. So I apologize if I have to pause and move things around. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about five topics tonight. Uh, the first is what to include uh, in terms of sort of optimizing your use of iNaturalist. The second is going to be how to document it. The third is going to be the advantages and I have to say the pitfalls of the uh, artificial intelligence utility called computer vision that's built into iNaturalist. Uh, the fourth is building a social network in iNaturalist, which as you'll see, I think is really kind of the key to using this platform as effectively as possible. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about data security, both as it pertains to privacy and as it pertains to protecting the uh, locations of rare or otherwise sensitive species. So I guess um, I can stop sharing for a second so you don't have to look at the same thing all the time. Uh, and just say that uh, basically, as far as the Atlas of Life is concerned, uh, Everything you put into iNaturalist is welcome and is a helpful contribution. It is, though, worth thinking a little bit about sort of how your interests run and how iNaturalist can help it. And I can't help you with that, but uh, as you get more familiar with the platform and maybe get more serious as a naturalist, you may start to think in those terms and start uh, sort of wondering what kinds of projects you can set up on your own to pursue your own interests. Um, so some people, you know, everybody's got a, uh, a, a different style for, for how they use iNaturalist. Uh, there are some people who use their iPhones exclusively to, to put data in, and some of them are really quite promiscuous in what they photograph and upload. They may rely on artificial intelligence to do most of their observations. And that's great. You know, you put a lot of information into iNaturalist. It, it's helpful in that respect. There are other people who are really fussy about what they put in. They want all their photographs in there to be really good. And they want to have all of their identifications done to their own satisfaction before they enter anything. That's fine, too. Uh, and there's everything in between. So basically, do what gives you satisfaction. Use it as much or as little as you like. I, I think you'll find that the more you use it, the more compulsive that you get about it. I mean, I, I always am whipping out the phone camera and snapping a picture of something or you know, in the middle of a conversation with somebody, I'll lean over and take a picture of a bug I've noticed. Uh, it, gets to be, it gets to be like that after a while. Um, 
but so on the so on the one hand, anything goes with iNaturalist, and whatever feels right to you is worth doing. But on the other hand, it's also worth keeping in mind that iNaturalist has some very strong biases that are kind of inherent in a citizen or community science project like this. Um, you tend to get a lot of representation of organisms that are large or obvious or charismatic, uh, or, and and are found where people tend to go. So the, the Atlas of Life project, we've got lots and lots of observations of monarch butterflies mm -hmm. and very, very few observations of least skippers. You know, it's like mm -hmm. monarchs, everybody knows it, everybody wants to photograph it. So you get lots of observations of that. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to keep it in mind just methodologically when you're setting up a project or trying to do research using iNaturalist that you can't just take data and use them automatically to get some kind of assessment of the relative abundance of things. You have to factor in how likely it is that they're going to end up in iNaturalist. So there are real sampling biases in the platform. A really good example would be, be oaks on Martha's Vineyard. Of course, those of us who, and Dave, Dave's been down here enough, so he knows too, are just incredibly dominant on the landscape here. I, I don't know how many oaks there are on the vineyard, but it's got to be millions. Mm -hmm. and, and how many uh, observations are there? Well, it's about the same number of observations that we have for Bombus impatiens, one species of bumblebee. Because people tend to think of trees as landscape. They don't think of trees as organisms so much. So they just don't think about. So in terms of what to put into iNaturalist, well, maybe you can sort of address that a little bit by every time you're in the field, look around and see sort of what the common kinds of vegetation are, what's, what's dominant there. Just take a few representative pictures and upload that with all the other stuff that you're taking. And then over time, that's going to add up to a, a sort of better representation of sort of what the landscape really looks like on the vineyard. Just a thing to keep in mind. Uh, I do want to say a word about domestic plants and animals, and I'll go back to sharing the screen here. <laughs> uh, um, there is a place for domestic domesticated animals and plants growing in a garden. When you think about it, they're living organisms and they're part of the ecosystem because, uh, you know, natural wildlife interact with them and feed on them and prey on them and so forth. So it's worth putting them in, but you don't want to create the impression that some plant from Asia has a natural population here on Martha's Vineyard, right? So you want to have a way to tag if you're taking a garden flower, you want to have a way to tag it. And there is such a thing in, uh, in uh, iNaturalist. You, you may not have really scrolled down much beyond this part of the screen, but way down at the bottom here over on the left is this data quality assessment. And if you look, one of the options here is, is the organism wild? So you can click mm -hmm. this thumbs down. Mm -hmm. it, it will convert the observation to a casual one instead of a research grade one. And it'll make it obvious to anybody who looks at it that yes, this is actually not a naturally occurring species, but it's something that's here um, as part of the, the human ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you can do to keep um, your, your data good and clean on iNaturalist. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things you can do. Well, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip that for now. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be getting to that. Um, I should mention that there was a question in the, the Google form that you filled out in registering this. Uh, somebody wanted to know whether uh, INAT supports video submissions. And as far as I know, it does not at this point. It, you can document an observation with a sound recording. <clears throat> you do it exactly the same way that you do with a photograph. You just kind of drag and drop it into the, uh, uh, into the, the application. Um, but I think there are probably technical problems with playing videos, and certainly there are issues about just the file size of videos. So at this point, you can't upload uh, videos into iNaturalist, but you can do sound recordings and, and photographs, of course. So <clears throat> a couple of things about uh, how to document. That's talking about what to put into it. Um, <clears throat> 
we want to make the data as good as they can be. So as few errors as possible. Ideally, everything will be identified as close to the species or even the subspecies level as the documentation will allow. And it will be correct. That's even more important than being precise is being correct. One place you can start with making data quality good is before you even go out into the field, make sure that the date and time settings in your camera are correct, even adjusting for uh, daylight savings time. PM, AM, it looks fishy if you've got a lot of butterfly images that are dated one o'clock in the morning. You really have, you know, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, but your, your camera is set wrong. Um, obviously, if the dates are off significantly, you can end up with summertime organisms looking like they were recorded in the winter. So very simple thing, just check to make sure that's, <coughs> that that's accurate. <coughs> and also if you use the, uh, the timestamp and the location stamp, if that's an option, most phones will do it, but some cameras will and some cameras won't in terms of adding the location. It makes data entry much, much faster and also more accurate. And my camera, I stupidly got one that didn't have G GPS capability. And the result is that I have to enter all of my observations manually, and it's less accurate and it's really time consuming. So if you possibly can, get a camera with a GPS utility in it. In terms of how to document things, I wish there were a simple answer. Um, I will say that the wonderful thing about digital photography is you can take millions of photos and it doesn't cost you a cent. It's just electrons bouncing around. Back in the day when we were shooting Kodachrome 64 and it cost about a buck or a buck and a quarter per photograph, uh, it was a very different thing, particularly since when you were shooting insects, maybe one out of a 36 exposure roll would come out decently. Um, Digital cameras have made just incredible difference in, in nature photography. But it's still, you know, you want to have, I mean, I, you, sometimes with a, with a common species or with an obvious species, all you need is one photograph. There's no point in putting unnecessary photographs in because that's going to take up server space and uh, increase the costs for iNaturalist. So if you get a beautiful broadside view of a monarch butterfly, there's no question what it is. All you need is that one photograph. But if you've got a picture of some little obscure lazy glossum bee, one picture is not going to cut the mustard. It'll, it might get you to genus. It might not even do that. So you want to take with insects uh, as many angles as you can. And there's no telling. I wish there were a simple formula for what matters with insects. Um, but there, there really isn't. It matter, it, 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 what matters differs from, from group to group. Uh, a couple of things that you should try to get pictures of. Uh, the, the pattern on the face can be really important. So a head-on view from the front is good. <clears throat> the pattern of wing veins can be very useful, particularly with flies, and bees. Uh, the antenna shape really matters. Uh, again, with flies, that's a really helpful thing to have. Uh, appendages at the end of the abdomen, which are often part of the external genitalia, are really important for things like katydids and grasshoppers. So if you can get a, a good sharp picture of the end of the abdomen of one of those things, uh, that'd be good. But the point is, if unless until you get to be pretty experienced at insects and, and sort of know some of these groups, you're not going to know what the money shot is. You know, you're going to have to just take pictures and then put up a sample, uh, get as many angles as you can, and then put up a sampling of seven or eight different angles if you've got that many good photographs. Over time, you will learn, <clears throat> particularly if you follow up later on after you've gotten an identification and go to some of those resources that I put in the chat section before we started. Uh, go to Bug Guide, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but Bug Guide has a lot of information on uh, identification tips. So you can go there and say, okay, the reason that somebody was able to identify this bee for me was that I got a really good picture of the clypeus, the front of the face, because the clypeus is distinctive in this bee. So that you'd salt that away, and the next time you're dealing with that uh, that taxon, then you're going to be in a better position to to get good photographs. 
Uh, there is a maximum of 20 photographs per observation. I don't think I've ever used more than about eight, but if, if it is something difficult and not obvious, don't be bashful about putting up two, four, six, eight, ten 10 uh, photographs, as long as they're good photographs that have useful information in them. So as you're putting uh, information into, uh, this is a horror, I, I, can't, I can't bear looking at this photograph, even though I can tell what it is. Uh, we got to get. We got a, a, a better looking observation here to, to work with. Uh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so there are there are various. Again, I, I, I mentioned the data quality assessments. There are various other ancillary things that we probably you probably don't spend much time on, but it's worth looking at these a little bit. Um, this section called annotations. And I'm actually going to switch and go to, uh, let's say, find a good B observation that's going to be helpful for this. Uh, yeah, so good old Bombus impatience. Um, <clears throat> You can click, I mean, this is obviously an adult. Um, I can't tell what the sex is. It's probably a male given the antenna length. But if I could tell what the sex is, I could just click the drop down menu here. And the reason that that's important or is worth doing is when you go to the taxon page, the species page for, for Bombus impatiens, which has all kinds of information. There is an about section. There is a map to show you where it occurs. Um, there is a phenology diagram. If you look at sex here, you can see that Males are in red and females are in blue. And you can see that there is a different seasonality for males and females in this species. That you get females as early as March or April in some areas, but you don't start getting males until you're into June, basically. So an important part of the biology of Bombus impatiens gets illuminated if enough people use these annotations. I'm not going to talk about projects today. That's another uh, kettle of fish, but it is very important. <clears throat> I will talk a little bit about tags, which I've just started using recently. Um, and I guess this is actually going to be one example of that. Um, I must have missed that one. see if this has it. Yeah, you can put in tags here that are just um, any character string at all. Um, I've been using, um, been kind of interested in studying the wildlife of the, the shoreline community. So I have, I use a lot of tags like uh, shoreline community, beach, great ponds, and I might use three or four of those just separated by commas in this tags area. And then when you go to your observations and uh, go to filters and you put in and update the search. You get all of these observations that I tag with that great pond tag. So these are all ones that I found along a great pond shoreline. Um, it's a little bit imprecise because the, uh, the search that you're using there in the filters, it'll pick up uh, other things too. It'll pick up notes and sort of, if the word great pond appears sort of anywhere in association with that record, it will pull it in to this sort. But it's a great way, you know, so now I'll be able to easily isolate records that are in this sort of informal study that I'm doing of uh, uh, the shoreline community of Martha's Vineyard. Um, and it's pretty much the same thing with um, 
observation fields. These are a little bit they're, they're, they work similar to uh, to tags, but see that you can you can use or you can create use existing or create observation fields and then put in like in this in this case the plant that the uh, the bee was associated with those end up working like tags when you search for them so I, if i wanted to find what uh, if i can show you a good example of that uh go to projects this is a, a project i'm working on to uh study the pollinators of farms on Martha's Vineyard. And um, again, we go to observations. So these are all 109 observations that were taken in some study plots on various farms. If we go to filter and put in the keyword Monarda, which is one of the plants that we're studying, you end up with 24 observations. It just selects those observations. It's one more level of filter. Uh, all of these were insects that were found on Monarda. So if you want to study what comes up on um, um, different plants, you could go to the filters, get it, and then you can actually download a spreadsheet. This is a little more sophisticated than we need to get into today, but actually download a spreadsheet of the plants in that, pro uh, the, the insects in that project using a particular plant. You can repeat that exercise and so you can end up with a bunch of spreadsheets with all of the observations uh, using different kinds of plants in your study. So it's a really powerful tool as you get into sort of more sophisticated kinds of analysis with them. Um, I naturalist. I'm going to move on to the third topic now, which is the use of um, the computer vision, the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that is so helpful, but also in some cases so infuriating about iNaturalist. Um, it works really well for certain kinds of things, um, uh, things that are relatively easy to identify or that there are a lot of well-identified observations for it will identify very, very quickly. If you put in a good picture of a butterfly, it will identify it correctly 100% of the time instantly, which is a great thing. But there are some limitations and those limitations can actually cause problems. So I think in a way, the sort of billing iNaturalist is an easy way to get identifications is a little bit of a mistake because it encourages people to think that, oh, I'll just put something in and click a button and I'll know what it is. It doesn't work that way. And if you try to make it work that way, you end up putting bad data into the system and that can cause real problems down the line. There, it's, it's an incomplete list that the computer vision is drawing on. It, it doesn't know about things that it doesn't know about, obviously, so it can't propose them as an identification. Um, if you haven't put in a location for your observation yet, it won't know where you are, so it might suggest something that lives in East Asia. And if you check that one off and accept it, uh, you create a very funny looking observation. Um, so basically, it's not intelligent. It's, it's horsepower. It's, it just is really good at doing visual comparisons between your photograph and a large database of photographs. But it doesn't really know what to look for. It just looks for general similarity. And it doesn't know what all the possibilities are. So let's look at a specific example of how this can go wrong. Um, so you start to get into more difficult taxa. Um, this is a little fly I photographed yesterday on the shore of the uh, uh, Edgartown Great Pond. And I, I happen to know roughly what it is because I've studied flies pretty much. And I'm pretty sure it's in the family Ephydridae. It's a so-called shore fly. And a couple of things point to that just very, very quickly. The configuration of the eyes being really widely separated on a blocky head like this. And then the shape of the antennae here that are sort of uh, like, a, like a spear point or something are both characteristics that really kind of suggest a phydridae to me. And so does the habitat because the, the family is known commonly as shore flies and indeed you find most of them uh, right on the shoreline. So I was pretty sure it was a phydridae. But what happens if you ask the computer vision to help you out? Well, the first thing it suggests, and it says it's pretty sure, 
is the genus Lispy, which is in a totally different branch of the business altogether. It's in a, it's a house fly relative. Uh, so it's in an entire, not just a different family, but a different zoo section. Um, so if you check that off, you know, you, you, you couldn't really be blamed for that if you don't know what a phydrudy looks like but you've put a pretty bad identification in there that somebody else is either going to be misled by or is going to have to fix. Fuselia is another one. I think probably uh, the artificial intelligence recognized that we were at the shoreline. So seaweed flies seemed like a reasonable choice. Same thing with silopa, which is, uh, uh, what do they call them, kelp flies. Uh, but again, we're, we're, we're way off the mark here. Finally, we get down to a genus that actually is in Ephydridae. Um, but the thing about uh, Octhera is it's a really, really uh, distinctive uh, genus. It's got these raptorial forelegs that look kind of like the forelimbs of a praying mantis with these really enlarged, um, I guess they're probably the tibia that are enlarged, and then a hook on the tarsus for grabbing things. And because it's really easily recognized um, of the species in, or of the genus in Ephydridae that are, your observations in Ephydridae that are recognized to genus, a high percentage of them are going to be Octhera. So the artificial intelligence algorithm says, okay, this is probably Ephydridae. What do I know about Ephydridae? Well, most of them are in the genus Octhera, so I'll propose that. But I'm really sure this isn't Octhera. Uh, again, it doesn't have those really enlarged um, raptorial forelimbs. Uh, I guess it's, it's the femur that would be enlarged and the, the hook would be at the, uh, the end of the tibia. So basically, um, if, we, if we relied on artificial intelligence to do this, we could have gone wrong in a whole bunch of ways. And you can even go wronger than that. Um, Instead of just viewing things that are found nearby, let's broaden the search and see what it comes up with. Uh, include sections not found nearby. Well, here, monolake alkali fly. We can, uh, I want to, I want to do, uh, let's see. Yeah, take a look at that. Okay, it's not a bad visual match. You can see how it, it thinks that's the case. But if we look at the map, as you'd expect from something called alkali, it's, it's really a Western species. And if we look at this observation, I can guarantee you that this is a relic. It's, it, in no way is this a mono-like alkali fly. It is uh, a relic of artificial intelligence suggesting a really bad choice and somebody accepting that choice. And you'll note that nobody has, um, has confirmed it because it's, that's not what it is. That's not even close to what it is. Uh, I really should just identify it as, as, as diptera uh, to, to prevent, you know, get rid of this spot in the middle of Michigan or whatever it was. Okay, so the, the point is that uh, artificial intelligence is a real boon in some sense, but it's also really dangerous in some other senses, and it can even go sort of create a, 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 a feedback loop where it proposes a bad, a, a bad identification, you accept it, and by doing that, you just in, in, encourage the artificial intelligence to make that same mistake again in the future. And somebody else, you know, more and more people do it and you start getting this acceleration and it, a misidentification kind of goes viral. And it takes a lot of work for people to rein that in and go through and correct those, you know, the experts go through and correct those observations one at a time and kind of tamp down the problem. So the bottom line here is that there is no simple solution. Uh, you need to... Uh, Uh, be aware of the limitations and sort of take into account the fact that it's not going to be an automatic uh, identification. One thing to keep in mind that'll help with this is that um, uh, computer vision only looks at the first image in your series of images. So if you're uploading eight images, 
pick your first one to be one that shows the whole organism and is sort of a good overall view of it. Don't put up the little uh, image of the fly genitalia as your first image because computer vision is going to look at it and say, what? Um, you know, you want a picture of the whole fly. So that will help a little bit in making sure that it's got good material to work with. Another thing that you should do is um, go back to uh, iNaturalist again. Um, here we go. Yeah, when you're putting in or uh, considering an observation, it will suggest these things and you can go to view and it opens up that taxon page in another window and you can look at it and say, is that a plausible match for what I posted? Well, yeah, it looks pretty good. All right. You can look at the map here and say, does Physalis occur where we are? Heck yeah. So you've done a little bit of ground truthing, a little bit of due diligence in terms of making sure that your uh, this, uh, this Physalis identification is a good one. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is um, use some of those other resources that I put into the chat, uh, like Bug Guide, and I'll just show you this very quickly. Um, I will often have Bug Guide, I mostly do insects, so I use Bug Guide more than a plant uh, aid for this. But Bug Guide is just a huge database of observations and photographs, so you can um, zero in. I mean, what I would what I would do if I were in iNaturalist um, is I'd search for uh, Ephydridae in Bug Guide. So this takes us to that problematic fly family that I was just using as an example. And you see you've got all the subfamily. If you click on one of the subfamilies, you get down to the genus. If you click on the genus, so you can use this as a tool for refining the identification that iNaturalist helps you get. Or you can put an identification in sort of whatever, identify something in iNat as just diptera, a safe high level identification. And then on your own time, go back and use something like bug guide to, to zero in on, on it. So um, using those other uh, resources, is a really good way to just sort of refine your observations and uh, make some additional progress. It's never going to be perfect. Um, nobody knows everything. And particularly if you're a relative new beginner at studying natural history, you're not going to know what a lot of things are. But particularly if you, you know, sort of zero in on some interests and start focusing your attention on, say, you're really interested in butterflies, pretty soon you'll get to be pretty good at identifying butterflies. And you'll at least know that something is a skipper. And, you know, that will help you when you work with the artificial intelligence and when you work with some of these other websites like Bamona, you'll be able to get uh, increasingly good observations. But the bottom line is that you're never going to get totally good results from the computer vision. It's just, it just, it's just theoretically impossible. And that's why I think that the most important thing and the real key to using iNaturalist effectively is to develop a social network um, of people who help you and who you help. And it's not hard to do. It takes a little bit of time, but there is a lot of similarity between iNaturalist and a social media platform like um, Facebook. Fortunately, there are a lot of differences too. There are a lot, a lot fewer jerks, for one thing. Uh, there are a lot fewer ads, and they don't sell your data. So it you sort of is the advantages of social media without the disadvantages. But um, let me let me let me tell you two stories, two happy stories about how well the social network can work in iNaturalist. I'm going to just sort of pick a couple of um, of my favorite observations. Um, P-O-O. 
epiloides search. <clears throat> okay, one, I have one, one observation in this genus. I was up in uh, Lexington, Massachusetts last June, just uh, I sort of took a, a, a bugging trip, I guess you could call it. I brought my bicycle and my camera and just uh, biked and eyed at it for four or five days. And I was walking around a conservation land, piece of conservation land in Lexington, where actually I've been going for about 50 years now. It's great fun to have that body of memory. But I was doing this thing where I um, just kind of walk along a path in the woods and look for things that are perched on uh, leaves because a lot of, you know, in a sunny patch in the woodlands, a lot of insects will bask on the top surface of a leaf in a sunny patch. And I saw this um, <clears throat> thing that I didn't really even know what it was. Um, I thought it was probably a bee, so I took a picture. Uh, got, I guess I took three or four frames, only one of which was any good. And right after I took this one, it took off. And it was funny because when it flew, it looked to me like almost like it was, it had a sort of humpbacked posture. And it looked to me like it might almost be two bees that were mating or something. It looked really weird. So that, that evening I was uh, working on my photographs and I looked at it. It's pretty clearly a bee of some kind. You know, I don't, I, I'm not great with bees, but um, it's pretty clearly a bee of some kind. So I put it into iNaturalists just as uh, uh, the Epa family Anthophila, which is the, the top level heading for bees. It's all the bees in the world fit under that epa family. And I added the not help, very helpful comment, uh, strange looking bee. Okay, and I went to bed a couple of, a couple of minutes later. And overnight, uh, Molly Jacobson, who is a friend of mine, and she follows me. And I would, and you probably know that you can follow people on INAT just like you can on Facebook. She took a look at it and she says, wow, it looks like Epiloides pelosula. Uh, that's really cool. So I Googled it and I answered her question about the habitat and I Googled it and found just a very few images and you know, it really looked kind of like uh, um, Epiloides. And then uh, Max McCarthy, who is a really good bee guy, at Rutger, a graduate student at Rutgers University, who I don't know if he follows me, but he identifies a lot of my bees. Um, really, really extremely helpful and friendly guy. And he says, you know, wow, it is Epiloides pelosilus. So I do a little bit more research and I agree with that observation. And um, then John Asher, who I mentioned earlier, he of the 900,000 uh, 900, uh, bee identifications weighs in and also says that it's Epiloides. So now it's really a good thing. Uh, we've got a really solid identification. And this happened in really about just about 12 hours from when I uploaded the observation. And it went from being a thing that I wasn't even entirely sure was a bee to being the species, identified to the species. And when we look at the species page, there is only one observation in all of I naturalist of this bee, and that happens to be mine. Uh, and when you read in the about section, it says, uh, no records after 1960, leading to speculation that it was extinct until it was refound in 20, 2002. So basically, it is this bee that is extremely rare. There are only a handful of known populations for it in the world. It's actually a nest parasite on a bee that is itself rare. So it's a parasite on, on a rare species. And you can imagine how specialized that makes it. So, um, and, you know, I, I really didn't do anything. All I did was get a halfway decent photograph of something that I didn't even know what was when I, photog when I photographed it. But because iNaturalist is so good at bringing expertise to where it's needed, that a couple of experts quickly weighed in and were able to elevate this observation from who knows what it is to, wow, this is something really cool. So that's one example of how effectively this can work when you've got a good social network. Um, another good one would be, uh, let's see, what's the name of that? Oh, Tripidia. Um, 
about four years back, whoopsie. There we go. Uh, I drove out to uh, Ohio to visit my brother who lives in Cincinnati and is also a naturalist. And we did some bugging together, of course. And I took this picture um, and I got home uh, back uh, a little while later. When was it? I took the picture on the 19th and I on the 27th, I uploaded it as the genus Trapidia. I think I probably did that without artificial intelligence. I probably used bug guide to get there. And my brother agreed with the genus. Uh, he had been there, so he saw the fly too. And then look, uh, two years later, you know, this is four years ago, two years after that initial observation went in, Trina Roberts, who was a really good surfeit person, confirmed that genus identification. So that's great. You know, Trina says, you got it right, it's Trapidia. And then two years after that, just a few days ago, she comes up with a species observation. I don't know what prompted her to go back to this. Maybe something put Trapidia into her mind. Maybe she just sort of skims old observations from time to time to see what's going on. But she came up with what she thought was a plausible species ID. We had a little bit of conversation. I asked my brother if he had any pictures of it. He did. So he put it up and that made me think, well, I'll check my photo archive. So I found additional pictures and I put up this one with a significantly different angle. And that allowed Trina to really say, yeah, that definitely is uh, Mammalata. So it took four years, but we got to the, uh, the species level with this observation. And again, um, if you look at the map, There we are in uh, Adams County, Ohio. The nearest observations are St. Louis. And there are only four observations, the two in St. Louis, and then my brothers and mine of that same individual. So again, it was like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I wasn't very good at flies at the time. I'm still not very good at flies. But because uh, Trina is such a generous person with her knowledge, uh, she was able to persist. Um, so a couple of things you can do to build this kind of network um, of people who will help you out. Um, you can configure your iNaturalist feed to show you things that you're interested in. You can see under the subscriptions, uh, I follow Orthoptera in Massachusetts, and I follow bees on Martha's Vineyard. If you want to subscribe to something and you go to subscribe to a place, you can say, you know, Massachusetts or Martha's Vineyard, the town of Chisbury, and whatever tax and butterflies or whatever. And then all of the observations that meet those criteria will turn up in your feed. So you start getting a lot more interesting stuff. And now when that stuff is showing up in your feed, you have stuff that you can interact with. Um, you can start following people who have, uh, you know, like this is a, you could just follow this person by uh, clicking that button. Observations would all turn up in your feed uh, just because you're following. Um, so in my profile, you know, I'm following 33 people and, um, when they, their observations turn up, I do my best to identify them. Uh, sometimes I comment, you know, great shot, uh, nice find on this one. Uh, sometimes I ask questions, can you explain to me why this is this species instead of this species? Uh, all of those things are fine as long as you do it constructively and politely. Uh, and then over time, some of those people will start following you so that your observations turn up in their feed. And they'll start to recognize you as somebody who's interested in flies or interested in butterflies or whatever, and is sort of a credible observation, uh, generator of credible observations that they're going to take a lot more interest in. And um, that'll help get pe more observations turning up from human beings instead of from, uh, from artificial intelligence. And another thing that you can do. Um, 
is uh, actually note that there is this section down at the bottom right as you scroll down of the top identifiers. So if you want to find somebody, if you think you might have a, a orthoptera that needs identifying, you can check on this guy's profile and you can tell he's done 214,000 observations, uh, identifications. So you know he's somebody who puts in a lot of time sharing his knowledge. You can tag him. You can just put in a comment at Brandon Wu. And that will turn up then, that observation will turn up in his feed. And the odds are very, very good that he will identify it for you. So you can use the tagging function in conjunction with this uh, list of people who uh, identify a particular uh, taxon to get draw people's attention. Don't do it uh, indiscriminately. Don't do it too much uh, and do it politely. Uh, if I tag somebody who I don't know, I usually say, I hope it's okay to tag you, but I see that you're an expert on this and I'm having a real problem with this observation. Uh, and if they do provide an observation, thank them for it, like you do for any other favor. So that, those are ways that you can kind of build your um, social network and ultimately the social network is going to work better than the AI for you. That's where the difficult observations are going to, our diff difficult identifications are going to come from. And you should reciprocate that. You should try to do uh, identifications for other people up to the limit of your ability. All right, I'm going to talk very quickly about um, one other topic, which is the uh, data security. And by and large, I should be clear, I think that um, iNaturalist works best when data is uninhibited and free and as complete as possible and out there for everybody to see. That's the whole point of a community-based uh, project like this. But there are times when maybe you don't want to publicize the location of something. It might be that you're uh, uh, on private property, uh, I have been known, I have to admit, to trespass on occasion in search of, uh, of interesting wildlife. I do it respectfully, but I may not want to advertise the fact that I was in somebody's, uh, you know, seasonal homes garden looking for bugs in, uh, in early March when, when they weren't there. Uh, it may be that um, it's a, a, a rare species that you don't want to, if something like wood lily is a plant that I, it's easy to imagine somebody uh, going out and poaching because they wanted to have wood lilies in their garden. So you might not want to have uh, the precise location given. So you can, in when you're edit, editing, uh, entering an observation, you can specify whether you want the, the uh, coordinates for that observation to be public or obscured or private. And if it's obscured, the observation just shows up as being in a, a 20 square kilometer box. So there's no preciseness to it. You may want to do this. I mean, there could be uh, personal reasons why you want it. If you're being stalked, God forbid, you might want to um, just not advertise where you're spending your time. Um, any number of reasons. You may, may not want to publicize where your house is if you're entering a lot of observations from your yard. So if there is a good reason, you can do that and you can edit an observation retroactively, um, change the privacy. Um, so that's something to uh, keep in mind. It's just a utility. I, again, I don't think you should use it if you don't need to. Uh, in theory, uh, iNaturalist will obscure, automatically obscure the, observ the locations for observations of species that are listed as endangered. But in practice, that doesn't always happen. You know, a species is listed in Massachusetts, but not in the United States. And maybe that unlisting, you know, the non-listed status in the United States takes precedence. So it, it, it doesn't get obscured and then you have to do it manually. So being aware of what's rare is, is a helpful thing. And being aware that you can um, obscure those locations if you need to. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if say there is a wood lily population that you would like to hide, 
you're going along, you're taking observation here, observation there, you're just a string of observations as you're walking along and all of those are public. And then there's one obscured observation of a wood lily and then a bunch more public observations. Well, anybody who hypothetically is interested in poaching some wood lilies would be very easy to find what's going on, figure out what's going on there. So if, if that were the situation, you might want to just sort of obscure the location of a bunch of those observations so that there isn't a clear track where you are walking. Um, it's not a major problem. I don't think poaching is a major problem of rare species. Um, and I don't think that, as I said, I don't think that you should just uh, willy nilly uh, obscure coordinates. But you can do it if there is a reason to, and you should know how to do it. Okay, um, that is basically what I've got for you. I will just sort of sum all of that up by saying that the key to why naturalist is not to think of it as a source of immediate gratification. I mean, you're all naturalists. You know that immediate gratification is not what studying nature is about. Things happen in their own time. Animals behave the way they want to, not the way you want them to. Plants bloom when they're ready to bloom, not when it's convenient for your needs. Everything about the study of natural history uh, militates against using it as a source of, of immediate gratification. But if you don't treat it as immediate gratification, if you treat it instead as a learning process, a gradual process where every observation you make is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the species, about the habitats that you're working in, even about how to use iNaturalist, um, and be patient and not too concerned about you know, getting that immediate species level ID, uh, let yourself identify things to the genus level or the family level. Um, it's better to be imp imprecise but correct than species level but wrong. So don't sort of succumb to that uh, temptation to say, well, I've t made an observation, I'm going to put it in iNaturalist, and it's going to tell me immediately what it is. That's just not how it works. And you get into problems and you cause problems for other people when you approach it that way. Mm -hmm. So it is a tool. iNaturalist is a tool. The artificial intelligence utility is a tool. Like any other tool, you can drive a nail or you can smash your thumb. Uh, it's, it, it depends on, on how intelligently you use it and how conscientiously you use it. Any questions? Chime right in. Yeah, Carla. Um, what kind of camera do you use for your, for your um, field work? Uh, I use my phone camera <laughs> for plants most of the time. And I use a, a APS-C sensor mirrorless camera, Sony, with a 90 millimeter macro lens on it for most of my bug photographs. And I, I like the I like the, the the phone camera because it it does record locations, and it's just really good for uh, you know when I take photographs of a plant for uh, for uh, iNaturalist, I'll do like uh, uh, looking down on the blossom, looking at the blossom from the side, looking at the top of the leaf, looking at the bottom of the leaf, looking at the intersection of the leaves and the stem, and then an overall view of the plant. So boom, 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 six shots. Later on, they just go all up right into iNaturalist and all the data are there. Um, and then for insects, it's a different thing. You know, you need to stalk it, you need to get into position, you need to work on it for a while and take pictures um, and the, the, re the resolution and the, uh, the higher shutter speed and so on of using a real camera is useful then. A lot of people use what are called bridge cameras, which are those all-in-one cameras that have a long zoom capability. Um, they work really, really well for natural history photography. You sometimes do need to use an add-on screw-on close-up filter so you can get close enough when, you, when you're using a long zoom, but they work extremely well. And uh, that's an, also a, a very viable option. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Everybody is ready for that adult beverage. I could tell. I certainly am. I've just about lost my voice here. Uh, thanks again for joining me tonight. And I really appreciate your interest. I really appreciate your interest in the Atlas of Life.